empty completeness in the earlier lectures in this course. And we sort of introduced the concept of empty completeness, but informally. So who remembers the informal definition of uh, an empty complete problem? Something cannot be solved in polynomial time. OK, so it cannot be solved in polynomial time, but this is not quite precise. So we give a precise yet informal definition of empty completeness. And that, inc that included three conditions. So we said that this is an informal. Because later on, we'll come up with a formal definition. An informal definition. So this is mathematically wrong. An informal definition of MP completeness. A problem is MP complete if there is no known <coughs> polynomial time <coughs> algorithm. There is no known polynomial time algorithm that does what? Can solve it in um, O of n squared time. No, no, it's, we, we do not have a polynomial time algorithm. So if, if a problem has an O of n power 7, this is a polynomial time algorithm. Well, even you know, if it's of n power 1,000, this is a polynomial time algorithm. So if a problem has an of n power 1,000, then that's a, uh, you know, that's a problem that is solvable in polynomial time in theory. But I don't think there is an, you know, such an algorithm. At least I have never seen an algorithm with, with, such, an high, with such a high polynomial order. Okay. Uh, in theory, this is polynomial time. So it doesn't matter, you know, what the order of the polynomial is. Uh, you know, of course, you know, remember from previous lectures, polynomial means that your exponent is a constant. So your variable is, uh, so the base is the, the variable, and your exponent is, uh, is a constant. While exponential is, you know, constant like 2 or 3 or 4 power n. So this is exponential, this is polynomial. And remember from previous lectures, in the earlier lectures, we calculated the limit at infinity of any exponential divided by any polynomial. And we proved that the limit of any exponential divided by any polynomial is, <coughs> what was the limit of any polynomial, any exponential divided by any polynomial? Yeah. The limit was infinity. Yeah. So there is no known polynomial algorithm that solves every instance of the problem in polynomial, uh, sorry, uh, every instance of the problem exactly. Or let's re rephrase this in a clearer way that, that computes that computes the exact the exact solution to every instance of the problem. So here, you know, we, we, we must distinguish between a problem and an instance. So the problem is an abstract thing, like uh, you know, the single source shortest path. This is an abstract. How many instances do we have of this problem? An infinite number of instances. You can come up with an, in, an infinite number of graphs, an infinite number of instances. Well, uh, you know, all the problems that we will be studying here, it's an, uh, an abstract problem of which you, you, you can have an infinite number of instances. So in this, uh, in this chapter, or in, 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 when we are talking about MP-completeness, it's very important to distinguish between 
a problem and an instance of a problem. So this informal definition, <coughs> it's informal, but it's very precise. So it says that a problem th that has no known polynomial time algorithm that computes the exact solution to every instance of the problem. OK? There is no polynomial time algorithm that computes the exact solution to every instance of the problem. So in order for the problem to be MP complete, all three conditions must be satisfied, meaning that there is no known polynomial time algorithm. So if, uh, you know, if there is an, uh, <coughs> uh, if there is an algorithm, for example, uh, uh, if there is an exponential time algorithm that can compute the exact solution to every instance, then that problem is still MP complete. So in order to, to uh, for the problem to be not to be MP complete, then you have to either find uh, you know, a polynomial time solution that can compute uh, all the instances. You have to find a polynomial time solution that can compute all the instances of that problem. But now, when we talk about no known polynomial time algorithm, this means that we're not saying that such an algorithm does not exist. Right? So we are saying that so far nobody has come up with an, a polynomial time algorithm that can compute the exact solution to every instance of that uh, problem, uh, which means that the question is still open. So uh, MP-complete problems, in theory, may have. So someone may discover a polynomial time uh, solution or a polynomial time algorithm to one of the NP-complete problems. And as we will see later, uh, if someone discovers a polynomial time algorithm for one of the NP-complete problems, this algorithm can be, solved to s can be used to solve all NP-complete problems in polynomial time. So if you solve one, you'll solve all. And this will make more sense later when we get into the details of uh, NP-complete problems. If you solve one of them, you can solve all of them. But so far, nobody has come up with a polynomial time algorithm. And nobody has been able to prove that such an algorithm does not exist. So this remains to be an open question. OK? So if the problem is MP-complete, <coughs> then there is no polynomial time algorithm that can compute the exact solution to every instance. But there may be an exponential time algorithm or a factorial algorithm that can compute the exact solution to every instance. In fact, you know, that's you know, the, the brute force solution to NP-complete problems is usually exponential or factorial. So it's usually exponential if, it's, uh, uh, if you are looking for a combination, and factorial if you are looking for a permutation. So if you are looking for an ordering, then it's factorial. And if you are looking for a combination, then it's, uh, it's exponential, uh, generally speaking. Now, you may find an approximate solution, of course. So for an empty complete problem, uh, you may find an, uh, an, uh, uh, you know, an algorithm that computes an approximate solution to every instance of the problem. So there is nothing that prevents an empty complete problem from having very good uh, approximation algorithms. So they do not have exact algorithms, but they may have good uh, uh, algorithms that compute uh, approximate solutions for all or most instances. Of course, if you have a polynomial time algorithm that can compute the exact solution to some of the instances or most of the instances, that's also possible. OK, so for MP complete problems. So if you relax one of these conditions, uh, you will find an algorithm, if you relax one of them. And looking at these three conditions, which one do you think people normally relax in practice when they work with MP complete problems? Exact, exact solution. Yeah, the exact. So in, in practice, people relax the exactness condition. So they just use 
polynomial time algorithms that compute approximate solutions to all instances. Is, is branch and bound an example of relaxing one of these? Well, that's a very good question. So what are we relaxing in branch and bound? When we use branch and bound to, to solve an MP-complete problem, what are we relaxing? Aren't you relaxing every instance? Because you could have a theoretically a really bad instance that would still run in non-polynomial time. Well, yeah, in, in practice you can think of it as relaxing the every instance condition. Because if you do branch unbound and you give it a certain time limit, so a branch unbound algorithm is not guaranteed to terminate within that time limit for every instance. Yeah, so from a practical point of view, you may think of it as relaxing the every condition. But from a theoretical point of view, in fact, you are relaxing the polynomial time. Because branch and bound, you know, we describe the branch and bound algorithm for the 0-1 knapsack problem. And in spite of all the pruning techniques and all the, low, the upper bounds that we have described, you know, the worst case is still exponential. So we did not prove uh, a worst case uh, running time for our branch and bound algorithm that is any better than exponential. So still, the worst case is exponential, but in practice, you know, as you have seen in, in assignment number four, there's a huge difference you know, between brute force and branch and bound. You know, brute force does not terminate within reasonable time, and it does not terminate in, uh, in our lifetimes, uh, while a branch and bound algorithm may terminate within seconds or even a fraction of a second. So from a practical point of view, there's a huge difference. But from a theoretical point of view, you know, the worst case is still exponential. So our branch and bound algorithm in, it has a, a worst case exponential running time. OK? So now what will we be studying here about NP-complete problems? What, uh, in this, uh, in, in our coverage of NP-completeness, when we study NP-completeness, uh, we do not focus on, we're not studying solutions to NP-complete problems. We, in fact, we're studying how to identify NP-complete problems, or how to prove that a problem is NP-complete. So basically, we are focusing on the diagnosis, you know, diagnosing the problem or identifying it as an NP-complete problem, but we're not, uh, we're not studying the treatment. You know, it's, uh, you know, NP-completeness is like a disease. You, know, you can think of it like a disease, and we're here focusing on the diagnosis. But what are the solutions? Well, branch and bound, one of them, right? If you, uh, if you don't want an algorithm that is guaranteed to terminate within reasonable time, or that is uh, you, you, you know, that still has a worst case running time of, uh, that is exponential. Branch and bound is a solution. Uh, if you don't care about exact solutions, then you can use simple algorithms like a greedy algorithm, for example. You can use a greedy algorithm if you don't care about exactness. And many NP-complete problems have greedy algorithms that compute, you know, reasonably good solutions for most instances. So not exact, but close, close enough in most instances. So the, the treatment is something that it depends on how exact you want to be and how close you want to be uh, to the exact solution. Uh, these are two examples. You can use greedy, you can use branch and bound. Of course, branch and bound is much more expensive. So there is some general, more general technique, which is integer linear programming. So integer linear programming is a, is a general technique for solving uh, NP-complete problems. But we will not cover it in this course. But I will just briefly describe it. And using this algorithm, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, come up with a mathematical description of the problem in the form of uh, constraints and a cost function. So we define the cost function mathematically and the constraints of the problem we define them mathematically, usually in the form of inequalities. So something has to be less than or equal to some limit, or greater than or equal to some limit. And given these constraints and cost function, uh, there are techniques for solving 
uh, integer linear programming uh, integer linear programming problem. So this is a general technique. Uh, but this is not going to be our focus here. Our focus here is on the diagnosis, on proving that the problem is empty complete. And how are we going to do that? We're going to prove that the problem is NP-complete by uh, transforming this problem into one of the problems that are known to be NP-complete by showing that a problem is similar to one of those, those problems that are already known to be NP-complete. So there's a bunch of problems that uh, you know, people already know to be NP-complete. And if you encounter a certain problem, uh, you prove that it's MP complete by making you know some kind of uh, transformation or what we will refer to as a reduction. In fact, you'll be reducing a problem that is known to be MP complete to the problem that you are trying to prove is MP complete. Uh, this is just an overview at this point, so we will see the details later. Uh, but now we're just trying to. Uh, you know, give an overview of what we will be doing. So here, uh, you know, the nature of this uh, topic is different from previous topics. Here we're not studying a design technique. 